to Signature TV News. I am Vin Martin Obiora Ilo. First, let's take a look at the headlines. ASU mobilizes for fresh strike, insisting political and diplomatic means have failed. Federal government rolls out one trillion naira palliative, massive construction projects. On the foreign scene, 13 people die after auto crash in southern India. U.S. 2024 presidential debate leaves supporters with mixed feelings. In sports, Argentina captain Lionel Messi may miss the final Copa America group stage game against Peru. And back in Enugu, Nollywood star John Okafor, popularly known as Ibu, laid to rest in his village, Amore, in Enugu state. Stay with us. The end, High Chief John Okafor, popularly called Ibu, having committed to Mother Earth at his country home, Eziokwa Amore, in Kano West local government area of Enugu state. Signature TV correspondent Ebenezer Odo joined other mourners at the event. Details of that event will come in our subsequent bulletins. Among notable dignitaries that raised occasion was the Labour Party presidential candidate in the 2023 presidential elections, P2B, the senator representing Enugu East Senatorial Zone, Kelvin Chuku, a large turnout of party chieftains, movie actors, clergymen, traditional ruler of Ezio Amore, Igwe Onwe, and a host of others. Governor Peter Mba of Enugu State says gaming has enormous potentials to drive and contribute meaningfully to the country's economy and tourism industry. The governor disclosed this during the Enugu State Gaming Conference in Enugu on Thursday with a theme exploring the future of gaming, innovation and collaborations. Mba, represented by his deputy Fran Sai, said that Enugu was eager to drive the innovation and regulatory process. The governor said his government has keyed into the industry to boost its revenues and its local economy. He, however, urged the operators and investors in gaming and lottery industry to imbibe the spirit of innovation and creativity to providing consumers with excellent services. Bad advice that the gaming and lottery operations should be done with higher standard of integrity, transparency and responsibility. He assured investors that the state government would continue to provide an enabling environment for the businesses to thrive, adding that it was the responsibility of the government to protect its citizens. While describing the conference as apt and ty timely, Mba urged the participants to come up with exciting discussions that will shape the future of the gaming industry in the country. Enugu South Magistrate Court on Thursday was visited with what could be described as an uproar as members of the Enugu South urban constituency staged a peaceful protest at the court premises. According to the constituents, there was an alleged move by the presiding magistrate, His Worship E.D. Omu, to commit the lawmaker representing the area in the state of a House, House of Assembly, Honorable Brighton Gene, of the Labour Party and a townsman to prison over a communal matter accusing the magistrate of bias in the case. A correspondent who was present during the court proceedings reports that three lawyers had, during the court session which held amid heavy police presence, strived fruitlessly to dissuade Omu to give a long adjournment date in the matter. Honorable Ngene, who was elected into the Enugu State House of Assembly in the March 18, 2023 election, had on Monday cried out for interventions against what he described as alleged plot and conspiracy by the executive and judicial arms of the state government to commit him to prison for insisting on the mandate he was given by his constituency. In a Save My Soul SOS alarm he raised in Enugu, the lawmaker hinted that both the Chief Judge of Enugu State Justice A. R. Zemene, 
the Deputy Chief Registrar of the State High Court, Chijo Kabo, and Magistrate E.D. Omu have colluded to terminate his political and legal careers by employing impunity to disobey the National Judicial Council NJC interventions to stay action, a charge against him, Ngene, and two others until the matter is determined by the NJC. The, the, said, the said matter had been lingering since 2017 before Ngene ran for the assembly election. When every effort by the defense counsels failed to sway the trial magistrate, they stormed out of the court, visibly angry, expressing disappointment with the manner the chief magistrate is handling the matter. Members of the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU University of Nigeria and Soka UNN chapter, have threatened to embark on strike over the failure of the federal government to address their grievances. This comes as the union said that it had employed both diplomatic and political means to no avail, insisting it's dealing with a hypocritical government. They issued the threat on Thursday following a peaceful march around the institution to protest the federal government's failure to implement an agreement with the union. Members of ASU UNN who bought different placards such as government stop forcing ASU to embark on strike, government honor agreements with ASU, government don't kill university education in Nigeria, Nigerian lecturers are the least, least paid in the globe, among other inscriptions, urge the government to renegotiate the th 2009 agreement with the union. The union members said they will support their national leadership's call for nationwide indefinite strike if the federal government failed to meet the union's demands after the 21 days ultimatum. The member representing the Ukweza South Federal Constituency at the House of Representatives, Chine Doaga, has inaugurated a study facility of the National Open University at the Abakaliki Custodial Center. Oga, who inaugurated the facility on Friday as part of activities to mark his 48th birthday ceremony, said it was the, to enhance the educational well-being of the inmates and give them hope of a secured future. The legislator said the inmates should be encouraged to embrace education while on awaiting trial or serving various sentences. According to him, the facility will be equipped with internet facilities to ensure that inmates receive quality education while plants are in top gear to partner with our United Nations Agency. He noted that the center alongside the one at Afibo would receive infrastructural facelift as captured in the 2024 budget. Oga advised the inmates to behave well in order to be useful to themselves and to the society when released. The National Universities Commission NUC has granted accreditation to 42 courses of the Federal University Lokoja Kogi State. The Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Olayemi Akungumi, while speaking to journalists in Lokoja on Friday, said the news was conveyed through a letter signed by the Acting Director of Accreditation, Abraham Chondusu, on behalf of the Acting NUC Executive Secretary, Chris Mayaki. Akungumi explained that the accreditation was sequel to the October-November 2023 accreditation exercise, which had now been released to the university. He commended the NUC for the accreditation of the university programs, describing it as a milestone received with great joy by members of the university community, particularly the 400-level students. He further revealed that the hope and chances of the 400-level students of graduating this year and mobilized for the National Youth Service Corps NYSC scheme were uncertain before now. Our King Wumi, however, expressed appreciation to the NUC members of Senate as well as staff and students of the university for their cooperation and tireless efforts that led to the remarkable achievements. Some of the newly accredited programs which cut across different departments and faculties include administration, accounting, banking and finance, business administration, public administration, arts, Arabic, archaeology and Christian religious studies. The Defense Headquarters says the military has recovered stolen crude oil worth 10, 10 billion naira in the Niger Delta amid the war against oil theft and vandalization in the region. The Director of Defense Media Operations, Major General Edward Buba, has disclosed this, disclosed this on Thursday during the bi-weekly briefing in Abuja. It said in the last three months, no fewer than 2,245 terrorists were killed in the north by the troops. 
Buba said during the second quarter of this year, troops also arrested 3,682 suspected terrorists and other criminals, as well as rescued 1,993 kidnapped hostages. According to him, they denied the oil theft of an estimated sum of over 10 billion naira. Recall that the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited said that it discovered 165 illegal refineries in the Niger Delta in a week. Still to come in the news, millions lost as fire raises Karu market in Abuja. UK Sunat hurts and angry over ref reform volunteers' racial smear. US 2024 presidential debate leaves supporters with mixed feelings. Don't go away. You're still watching Signature TV News. President Bola Tinubu on Thursday gave all the state governors seven days to provide concrete feedback on their plans to boost food production in their respective states. Tinubu gave the directive at the 142nd National Economic Council meeting attended by state governors and some deputies at the State House Abuja. The president announced a national construction and household support program which will see 100,000 families in each state getting 50,000 50, Naira grant for three months, 155 billion Naira to be disbursed for assorted foods, 540 billion Naira for household grants, even as 36 states and the Federal Capital Territory will get 10 billion Naira allocations each for the CNG buses. While emphasizing the urgency of boosting food production in the country, the President urged state governors to work together to meet the needs of citizens, stating his willingness to provide the needed support to ensure that Nigerians are relieved of hardship. A devastating fire outbreak has struck the Karo market in the Federal Capital Territory, leaving a trail of destruction and loss. Reports say goods and property worth millions of Naira have been reduced to ashes, leaving traders and shoppers in a state of despair. The FCT's fire service with a station in Karo Market responded to the incident. However, faced allegations in ex however, they faced challenges in assessing the scene due to the large crowd of people flocking to the area. Despite the challenges, soldiers were on ground to maintain order and ensure the safety of everyone involved. Preliminary investigations suggest that the fire may have been caused by an electrical surge which quickly spread and engulfed parts of the market. The full extent of the damage is still being assessed. However, it is clear that the fire has left a significant impact on the community. The cause of the fire is still under investigation and officials are working to determine the exact circumstances surrounding the outbreak. The national youth leader of the new Nigerian People's Party, NNPP, Awal Musa, has described the EFCC investigation on the former Kano State Governor Rabiu Kwankwaso as a political witch hunt. Speaking in Kaduna, Musa said the action was initiated by some political rivals with plans to tarnish Kwankwaso's image. He challenged the EFCC to come out with facts on the allegations, arguing that there was no justification for EFCC to commence investigations of Kwankwaso from 2015 to 2023 as a former governor and leader of the NNPP. According to him, investigating an honest and hard-working person like Pankwaso will only amount to a waste of time. Musa urged EFCC to disregard any petition written against Pankwaso by any politician or any associate. Reports say 13 passengers commuting in a van died and several were injured after it collided with a stationary truck at a highway in India's southern Karnataka state, local media reports said on Friday. The bodies of the victims and other injured passengers were taken by ambulance to were taken by ambulance to the local hospital for further treatment. The accident took place at midnight on the Bengaluru 
Prune National Highway in the Haveri city of Kanataka. South Korea's military on Friday released a video showing a North Korean missile abnormally spiraling early in flight and exploding. It was a rare publication of surveillance footage to dismiss Pyongyang's claim of a successful test. Footage filmed by a thermal observation device with South Korean frontline units showed a projectile spiraling out of control on an irregular flight path, then disintegrating. The South Korean military assessed that instability during flight led the missile's explosion, it said in a statement on Friday, calling North Korea's claims of success as deception and exaggeration to cover up for failure. North Korean state media had said that Pyongyang successfully conducted an important test on Wednesday aimed at developing missiles able to deploy multiple warheads, a claim rejected by South Korea. North Korea's official KCN agency says North Korea's missile administration used the first stage engine of a solid fuel intermediate range ballistic missile to test separation and guidance of multiple warheads. Iranian experts in United Arab Emirates headed to a polling station at their country's consulate in Dubai on Friday to cast their votes in snap presidential elections held following the death of Ibrahim Raisi. Despite the limited choices, some Iranian voters hoped that their vote could have a positive impact on life in Iran and beyond. Iranians started voting on Friday for a new president following the death of Ibrahim Raisi in a helicopter crash choosing from a tightly controlled group of four candidates loyal to the Supreme Leader at a time of growing public frustration. The elections coincides with escalating regional tension due to war between Israel and the Iranian allies, Hamas in Gaza and Hezbollah in Lebanon, as well as increased Western pressure on Iran over its fast advancing nuclear program. While the election is unlikely to bring a major shift in the Islamic Republic's policies, its outcome could influence the succession to Ayatollah Ali Khamenei's Iran's 85-year-old supreme leader in power since 1989. Heavy rainfall and winds at New Delhi's main airport on Friday caused a roof to collapse, killing one person. A portion of the canopy at the departures area of Terminal 1 collapsed at 5 a.m. Video from the Daily Fire Service showed cars crushed under collapsed columns. Several people were injured in the incident and flights from the affected terminal were temporarily suspended. India's aviation minister said he was monitoring the situation and the first responders were working at the site. Flood water up to four meters deep submerged a village in eastern China's Ahui province next to Xinyan River on Friday, state media CCTV have reported. The average rainfall in Hongshan City over the past nine days reached 580 millimeters, which means the total amount is equivalent to water in 200 West, West Lakes, causing 58,000 people to evacuate. Footage aired showed rescuers evacuating standard residents with lifeboats in Nanchang, Jiangxi province. China has provided more than 2.3 billion yuan in funds to help with rescue efforts, emergency supplies, and planning as deadly floods and landslides caused by almost two weeks of torrential rain ravaged several parts of the country. Coming up, Fra French President Macron says there is need to protect French values. U.S. 2024 presidential debate leaves supporters with mixed feelings. Antonio Rudiger to be part of Germany's game against Denmark. Don't go away. What is
The funeral of 19-year-old motorbike taxi driver Ibrahim Kamau, who was shot twice during Tuesday's protest in Kenya, became a focal point for the growing youth-led movement challenging government corruption and governance. Kamau's mother, Edith Wanjiku, mourned her son, describing him as a calm young man and a happy person who was never involved in crime. Wanjiku's plea for justice resonates with a larger call for change reverberating across the country. Following their successful campaign against a $2.7 billion tax increase proposed by President William Ruto, Kenya's young activists are refocusing their efforts on the broader issues of corruption and bad governance. The abundant finance bill, critics say, was only a symptom of the systemic problems confronting a country where strong economic growth has failed to translate into job opportunities for many of the youths. The youth-led movement marks a significant shift in the political landscape in Kenya. Historically, protests have been orchestrated by the country's political elites, often culminating in power-sharing arrangements that offered little benefit to the masses. For more analysis on the Kenyan crisis, we are joined by Dr. Njoki Metubo, household economist expert based in Nairobi, and also by Professor Uchen Neku of the Union College, New Jersey, in the United States. Um, you all welcome to uh, this segment of the news. Thank you very much. Dr. Metubo, let me start with you. How would you describe the events of the last few days in Kenya? And is there a way out of this crisis? Uh, the way I can describe the event is that it's, uh, do I say amazing or shocking or incredible? All in one sentence because we are having young people, these are graduates, most of them are graduates, university graduates, college graduates, uh, who have organized themselves and nobody is uh, directing them, nobody is supporting them. And they're saying no, first of all, to impunity because uh, of what has been happening. And everything broke loose because of that uh, draconian uh, finance bill. And these young people, because they have a very high understanding, they are able to do an analysis. They are able to see that what everything means, what that bill means to them. They decided because our constitution allows to speak out. And they were able to mobilize each other and they went out in the streets and they were saying no, no to the finance bill. 2024, not to impunity, not to corruption. So the events are, I would say they are amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed because these are young people. We are used to politicians organizing and, and, and funding such activities. But right now we are having young people who have no leader, they're leading themselves and they are out in the streets and they're they, they are organized, they are moving in unison in all the towns, the major towns and villages in the country. It's amazing. Yeah, Doctor Yeah, Doctor Metubo, of course you are joining us by telephone all the way from Nairobi. But in the studio uh, here in Nigeria we have uh, Professor Uchenna Equa of the Union College of New Jersey. Uh, uh, Prof, uh, you followed this uh, these events. What is the significance of what is happening in Kenya? Well, they, as far as I'm concerned, uh, just like Dr. Metubo said, uh, these young people, are, they don't have a leader. They are organized. They are probably, they're not really organized, so to speak, because they don't have a leader. And the significance from a communications point of view, because, because I'm a communications scholar, I always look at it from that prism. The fact that they're able to use social media to mobilize themselves as effectively as they have done tells us the power of communication. Moreover, it tells a larger story in the Africa context. 
typically in Kenya, the dominant ethnic groups, the Kikis and Luos, they always fighting each other. And most politicians from these particular angles, if you remember what happened in 2007, the post-election violence, even in, two, in subsequent years and all that, politicians have always done this, but these are young people. And that tells me that the future of Africa is really dependent on these young people because they don't care where you come from. The same thing can happen in Nigeria, any place. So most times you discover that most of these politicians want to use ethnic cleavages to divide people. But as you can see in this movement in Kenya, which can be replicated in other African countries as well, young people understand the stakes. You can no longer take them for a ride. But again, I also believe that it was good that the government listened to them by, you know, stepping down the bill. That is correct because it tells us that the, the, the democracy is about the power of the people and the people are the repositories of power. That's what these young people have demonstrated in this protest. Let, let me come back to you, Dr. Metubo in Nairobi. Um, the, the government has backed down. But it doesn't lo look like the youths are switched. They are still on the streets. Yeah. Uh, what I would like to say is that uh, I, I think people our age, we don't understand the power of technology. We don't understand the age of information. We don't understand what communication is. These young people they are students of the law, they are law students, they are graduates of law, they are able to translate the constitution and understand each and every act. So when the president says that uh, he has conceded, he's withdrawing the, the bill, the financial bill, these children, uh, for, let me just call them children there because they're actually my children, my children are that age, they are able to go to the Kenyan constitution and they are able to extract a portion of our constitutions that defines what the president did and that is why they are not satisfied because the parliament is on recess and the president cannot, cannot throw out a bill that had been passed in parliament and if uh, it has to go back to parliament when the parli parliament is uh, the parliament is on but if the parliament is on that bill becomes an act within a period of 21 days by the lapse of those 21 days the parliament will still be on recess that is why these young people are not relenting we 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 are not able to understand who they are and the information they have they understand the constitution they understand the life they are able to translate Doctor, so that is why they're not relenting. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Metubo, tell me, yeah. you are in Nairobi, and Nairobi was like the nerve center of uh, what, what, what has happened in, in the last couple of days. Is it yeah. true when some people we have spoken to in Kenya say that a lot of people are in hiding, that security officials are looking out for those they describe as troublemakers, organizers. Is that a true representation of what is happening in Kenya right now? Uh, uh, it is evident and it's actually on camera. The abductions have been happening. Uh, they assume that uh, the perpetrators of uh, the social media, what do you call those social media, various people who are very vocal. On social Influ media. The influencers. I'm trying to look for the word. The influencers. Been, yeah, the influencers. Yes, that is the word I was looking for. <laughs> sorry. And uh, the abduction, some are captured on camera because now with the with the age that we are in, there are CCTV everywhere, there are cameras everywhere, and uh, the LSK has gone to court, and uh, there is a demand by the Human Kenya Human Rights Commission that uh, all of them be released. There are some who have been released, but I. I, I understand, I'm made to understand, I'm not very sure that there are others, there are others who, who are in hiding, they are receiving threatening messages. 
but uh, the ones who were arrested they were not allowed in court because there is no offense that they have committed okay so there is that there is that tension okay let me come back to you uh, uh, professor Uchenneko. what is the implication of what is happening in kenya to the rest of africa what message does it send to leaders across africa where a lot of the ordinary people are suffering while leaders are living in affluence and there's so much hunger what message does the situation in kenya send the clear message is that when you are involved in policy making obviously you must take into account the people you are governing most times most leaders in africa or perhaps some other places as well do not consider they do not communicate with their their, their followers the, the the ordinary folks these this government should have seen this in coming if they had done a thorough public opinion survey to determine the popularity or otherwise of the finance bill sometimes most leaders arrogate to themselves absolute knowledge they stay in in the study of power and think that they can think for the rest of the citizens that is wrong and today when people are so effective like you had dr metubo said these young people are able to look at the constitution to see the gaps the failures what government the lacunas, has, uh, the lacuna as it were right sometimes you know uh, when most african uh, citizens are so docile they don't know what is their left from their right but today young people are able to also compare what happening in other countries as well because of the power of communication they are monitor what is happening in western countries and they want to live a very great life so like he, he, she said as well young people today you can no longer take them for granted like if you see it's just like when we're even discussing issues about misinformation and all you can't even pools in their eyes that can cross check and verify facts and bring it to their face and uh, uh, so the message is just that we can no longer take people for a ride the world is open if you if you tell a lie as a leader it can be fact checked instantly okay so the constitution of kenya is there and these young people like uh, dr motubo some of our law students they're able to find out things it's not like you're governing like in the era of uh, Kenyatta in the 60s. Jomo no, Kenyatta. Jomo Kenyatta. <laughs> so today, things are different. <laughs> you know, so that's just the message. Okay, um, let's just take the last word from you, uh, uh, Dr. Njo Kimetubo in Nairobi. Um, how do you think this can be resolved? What's the way out? A lot of people are calling for the resignation of the president. And it, it doesn't look like it's, it's something he's considering. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know how you can resolve uh, a situation when your child look at you and tell you, Dad, you are lying. So, and they know, and you yourself, you know that you are lying. So the way to resolve is to, first of all, understand the people we are dealing with. These are fearless, they are tribeless, they are borderless. They keep on telling us the only thing they fear is uh, is a lack of data and uh, a low battery. That that is a message by itself. I I hand that on and say that uh, young people are committing suicide every day, so death is not a problem to us. You kill me, others others will come up. So you're dealing with the fearless generation. They are saying openly they are not religious, they are spiritual, so you can imagine what that means. You cannot convince them anything. So in, 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 in other words, they want the, the, the leadership to tell them the truth. Transparency. And the, yeah, and the transparent the and... and... They want fairness. Okay. When you start moving around showing these jobless this. graduates that you are wearing a watch worth five million, and they Just know your salary because they have an access. The everything now, F oh, the, this is the age of information. All of our personal data is on the net. Absolutely. So they are able to see how much you earn as a salary, and you're flashing a five million watch. And that boy, that you. girl is jobless. Thank you. Not, not Metubo. Thank you. They're making life better for you. They tell you that you're lying. I on the other hand, they're checking the constitution. 
They understand it, and they are looking at your words. Thank you, Dr. Joki, Njoki Metubo. Okay. Thank you I'm so much. I'm just going to leave a, a, a word, or should I say a phrase, from um, the former Supreme Court Justice in the United States, um, Brandeis. He says that um, um, sunshine is the best disinfectant. What it means is... We have to be tra transparent. Transparency is the key to there. You can't hide anymore. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> thank you, Professor Uche Nekwo from the Union College in New Jersey. And thank you, Dr. Njoki Metubo, household economist, expert based in Nairobi. Thanks for your time and for joining us on the news. China has on Friday urged the United States to stop tolerating and supporting provocations by the Philippines after Deputy Secretary of State Kurt Campbell expressed concern about Beijing's destabilizing actions in the South China Sea. Campbell made the remarks to China's Vice Foreign Minister Ma Zhongwu during a telephone call on Thursday, the U.S. State Department said. At a regular briefing on Friday, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning said that the Philippines had turned its back on a consensus with China, challenging its sovereignty and territorial integrity and, and insisting on delivering construction materials to a grounded warship. China and the Philippines have recently traded acquisitions over dangerous and illegal maneuvers affecting their respective vessels in the area around the Second Thomas Shoal, a disputed atoll in the busy waterway. The far-right national rally is taking the French electorate for granted, French President Emmanuel Macron said in the early hours of Friday. This comes two days before the country goes to the polls in parliamentary elections. The party's Marine Le Pen said on Thursday that Macron would have to appoint her party's leader, Jordan Bardella, as prime minister after the vote, and that the party would keep the president in check even on foreign and defense policy predictions Macron dismissed as arrogance. The party has proposed that French people with dual nationality should be barred from some strategic administrative posts. One of the outgoing lawmakers went further saying that a former education minister with dual French Moroccan nationality should never have been appointed, but his comments were quickly denounced by Le Pen. The final outcome of the election will be known after a second round of voting on July, in July. Opinion polls see the national rally winning the popular vote, but it is hard to predict how that will translate to seats due to the two-round voting system. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says he was hurt and angry that a supporter of Nigel Farage's right-wing Reform UK party had been recorded making a racial smear about him, saying it was too important for him not to speak out. Sunak, Britain's first ethnic minority prime minister, was responding to comments by a man named as Andrew Parker, calling Sunak a British racial slur for people of South Asian descent. Sunak was born in the southern English port city of Southampton in 1980 to Hindu parents of Punjabi Indian descent. Faraj said in a statement late on Thursday when the comments were first broadcast that he was dismayed by the language. United States presidential President Joe Biden has squared off against his Republican rival, former President Donald Trump, in their first debate since the 2020 election cycle. Thursday night rematch of the longtime political adversaries took place at CNN's studios in Atlanta, Georgia. Our correspondent, Clinton Okolo, has more. Polls show Trump and Biden in a dead heat leading up to the November 5 general elections. But critics were especially harsh about Biden's performance, which was perceived as fumbling. Biden and Trump exchanged barbs over global wars in Ukraine and Gaza, immigration, abortion and threats to U.S. democracy. None of the candidates has been officially named their party's nominee, but both Trump and Biden pushed for an earlier debate to ensure they could reach voters before voting begins in September. A bombastic Trump lashed out at his successor, calling him a failure on economy and the world stage. Biden looked to hit back, but his delivery was faltering as he spoke rapidly in a trailing off voice, stumbling on his words and staring open-mouthed. It was the first debate ever between a president and a former president, and each accused the other of being history's worst. Trump and Biden, who were each the oldest presidents when first elected, 
even accused each other of being childlike as they argued over their golf swings. Biden, 81, and Trump, 78, did not shake hands as they walked to their podiums at the CNN headquarters in Atlanta. There was no live audience and their microphones were muted as the others spoke. Biden hit Trump with clearly rehearsed lines as he sought to remind millions of television viewers that Trump would be the first convicted felon in the White House. Ahead of the debate, supporters of both candidates have been throwing jibes at both of them. A badly wounded Joe Biden looked to get his re-election campaign back on track on Friday after the debate's performance that unnerved supporters and left allies of Donald Trump unable to conceal their glee. Democrats had hoped to see the president defiantly answering critics who say he is too old for a second term while hammering Trump on his criminal record and the threats they say he poses to democracy. Instead, many acknowledged they got a faltering display from a candidate who sounded hoarse for much of the showdown, stumbled over words, pulled punches, often stared open-mouthed and looked confused. Trump's performance was far from accomplished his verbal fusillades were littered with falsehoods and he dodged several times when asked about what he would do about the opioid crisis ravaging middle-class families. Reports have it that while Biden made nine false or misleading statements, Trump made a staggering 30, including falsehoods on abortion, the U.S. Capitol insurrection, health care, and NATO. From the Foreign Desk, Clinton Okolo, reporting for Signature TV News. And now sports, Argentina captain Lionel Messi missed training on Thursday due to muscle pain, while his presence in their final Copa America group stage game against Peru remains in doubt. Defending champions Argentina trained at the Miami International University Sports Ground without Messi, who underwent medical tests and kinesiology sessions, according to Argentine media reports. Messi will turn 37 this week and has been suffering muscle niggles required brief medical treatment on his thigh during Argentina's 1-0 victory over Chile this week at the U.S. hosted tournament. The Inter-Miami player said it might be wiser to sit out the Peru game on Saturday with his team already qualified for the next round after two wins. Germany's defense received a much-needed lift on Friday morning as centre-back Antonio Rudiger took part in the team's final training session ahead of their Euro 2024 last 16 tie against Denmark. Rudiger had been in doubt after sustaining a high thigh injury in his size final group game against Switzerland, but is expected to start against the Danes on Saturday, provided there is no reaction after Friday's training session. With centre-back partner Jonathan Tarr suspended after picking up his second yellow card against the Swiss, Rudiger is likely to be joined in defence by Nico Skluder Tupperk, who replaced Tar on the hour mark after he was booked. The winner of Saturday's game will go on to meet either Spain or Georgia in the quarterfinals. And that's the news hour. I am Vin Martin Obiora Ilo. Thanks for watching.